Major support for Carolina Business Review is provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. And Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Well, summer seems like a natural time to kind of chill and reflect about all those things that do occupy and keep us busy the rest of the year as we decompress on a beach trip or with our toes in the stand, sand or whatever is, is what is taking our attention away. What does rise to the top of our awareness and our attention? What do we think about? This is the most widely watched source of Carolina business and public policy. I am Chris William. Happy summer. And when deadlines and strategic objectives are not looming, what other maybe more important issues can we finally have time to address and even daydream about? We will start in a moment and later on, Minor Shaw, a longtime Carolina born leader, joins us again. Gratefully acknowledging support by Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina. Please visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Bearings, a leading global asset management firm dedicated to meeting the evolving investment and capital needs of its clients. Learn more at bearings.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Angela Mack of Gibbs Museum of Art, Brenda Berg, from Best NC, and special guest, Minor Shaw, president of Miko LLC. Happy summer, uh, welcome to our program. Angela, welcome from the Holy City. That is not a small trip, so thanks for making it. Uh, Happy to do it, thank you for having me. And I know it's hard to leave Charleston. <laughs> Uh, and, and of course, welcome from the Triangle, Brenda, good to see you again. Uh, so ladies, uh, happy summer. You know, which brings up a good point. We've got summer, we've got people getting distracted with old life and the fun parts of life. Is it hard to kind of gin up support for education or other initiatives, even with the General Assembly kind of closing out in North Carolina? Brenda, how do you, how do you kind of keep those things front and center that need to stay front and center? Well, I can tell you, long session year, I wasn't actually expecting to have a summer. So it looks like, yeah. <laughs> it looks like nice we're surprise. wrapping up the session before July 1. And um, I will spend July and August really preparing, um, not just for next year's legislative session, but a, a very ambitious schedule in the fall with business leaders and helping to further engage them on education issues. So mm -hmm. we have a lot of plenty, plenty of work to be done. And, and thankfully, the legislature over the last few years has been very generous on education. And so we have new programs in place that we can be working on getting them implemented and getting them moving forward. Lots to be done. Yeah, How, is that your take, Angela? Uh, most definitely. The summer months are extremely busy in terms of planning for the coming season. And, you know, it seems like we work harder in the summer than we do in the winter, in the fall, winter, and spring, because it's getting everything lined up, getting everything ready, and still ta staying in touch with your donors and mm -hmm. with your legislators and your city councilmen to let them know that we're preparing for yet another fantastic year of activities. So, you, 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 and not to speak for you, Brenda, but so Brenda, in some cases been strapped on the edge of a helicopter blade when it comes to trying to get education policy going on in the great uh, in the old north state in south carolina arts culture uh and these are my words angel kind of get pushed to the side because the the, the state house has been focused on transportation mm -hmm. and education and reform and some ethics issues. So do you feel like that arts and the cultural take a back seat in South Carolina in well, some cases? Our job is to make sure that doesn't happen. <laughs> and we work very hard to uh, inform our representatives of the importance of the arts and arts education so that it doesn't take a back seat. Because as far as we're concerned as, as museum professionals, and being in the museum profession for so many years, 
children are lose something when they're not part of an education system that that provides good art education and this has been shown over and over and over again um, you know we are very much behind the concept of steam as opposed to stem <laughs> where the arts is the a in mm -hmm. the word mm -hmm. and uh, we are planning particularly with the launch of a 10-year strategic plan that we will begin in September uh, to really bring that to the fore for our community and beyond. So, Brenda, are you nodding because you agree with the A in, in the acronym of STEAM? I do. Does that make, does that make it easier or harder or, or, or indifferent when you're talking about education policy? Oh, it, 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 I think that we've had a really good, strong push on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math for the last several years, and mm -hmm. we have momentum behind that. And yet our employers in North Carolina recognize that there's something more and that's grit and creativity and leadership and team building. And a, a lot of what happens in arts develops those work skills. So having the A in STEAM actually is, is great and it's incredibly important. And it's proven. I mean, one of the best case studies that we have seen has actually come out of Arkansas with the fairly new museum called Crystal Bridges. Uh, they took the opportunity early on, because that museum is only a few years old, to provide studies, to partner with the University of Arkansas and do studies that relate to how children respond to visits to the museum before and after uh, classroom activities and how that changes their ability as critical thinkers, as working together as a team, and then um, now more so in terms of mm -hmm. test scores. I, 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 sorry to interrupt you. I don't want to go too far down the hole, but I want to ask you this question. We had the chancellor at UNC School of the Arts sat on this set once and mm -hmm. said his name was John Mauchery at the time. And John, Chancellor Mauchery said that he said he thought that getting an MFA was more important than getting an MBA hmm. because he thought the critical thinking nature or the creative thinking nature of a Master of Fine Arts was more important than having the traditional statistical clinical business. I'd like to meet him. Well, <laughs> I mean, you know, that sounds good, but it, is, there, is there some truth behind that? Absolutely, there is truth behind it. You need well-rounded people and uh, in order to do well in the workforce. And without that component, without that empathy that art provides you, you won't have that. Yeah. Empathy was exactly the word I was going to use as well. If you think about IQ is absolutely important, but EQ is also important. And I think the arts um, and, and sports and having a, a world-class mm -hmm. zoo that children have access to, animals, all of that creates that empathy that's so important. But, but in North Carolina, Brenda, when you're struggling just to get principals up to a standardized pay <laughs> and teachers up to a standardized pay, general, the General Assembly is not going to want to hear the fact that, well, we've got to layer in arts and some funding right. for arts on top of this, are they? Well, I think there, there's actually been a, a, a movement to support the arts. I think North Carolina has a, a strong history of supporting the arts, and so I don't see it getting pushed to the side. We've luckily had a lot of economic growth, and so all of the teacher pay and the principal pay has been layered on top. I'm not seeing anything mm -hmm. else getting cut or pushed to the side. And I really believe that the, the more we focus on great leadership, whether it's how we prepare our principals, recruit them into the profession, or how we pay them, great principals will understand how important the arts are and they'll yeah. make sure that that's part. And it, it could be it could be PTA money. PTA money is a very, very, very small percentage of spending, but I, my children went to a Title I elementary school that had a small PTA budget, mm -hmm. but that money went for arts. It went for buses to go mm -hmm. on field trips. And so, it, it, yes, we should have state resources for that, but there, there are other resources as well, and a great leader will figure out how to get those resources. And there are also ways to create public-private par partnerships, particularly if you have a strong group of museums and cultural organizations in a city or in a community. I mean, there is always that, that way to raise money to provide mm -hmm. good arts education. I mean, at the Gibbs, we do it all the time. We provide our museum teachers that go into classrooms to bolster 
the art education that may already be there or may not even be there, uh, in addition to providing um, or getting grants to get Title I students to come to the museum. We, we've got about a minute left, and I want to I want to give you the final word on this one, Angela. Uh, in South Carolina, over the last couple of years, has really fine-tuned its economic development machine. You've seen a lot of, of, of course, this is not a surprise, a lot of great announcements, including Volvo cars and Boeing yes. and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, in about, literally, in a minute, wh where do the arts play into an economic development incentive and machine? Where do they? Where do they plug in? What's important? Well, so many of these major corporations right now are focused on building their employee base. And as far as we're concerned, in order to have a strong, creative employee base, the arts have to be part of that education process. And it's, it's I think in the years to come, we're going to see that more and more. The tide is going to turn, I think, mm -hmm. more from the focus on STEM to this introduction of creativity because, you know, at the end of the day, art is is just about anything, whether whether it's someone creating a website or or an interior designer. I, you know, I was talking to someone the other day about the fact that Boeing puts a lot of effort into the colors that they use for their airplanes. I mean, this is this is a big deal, and uh, and we're right there to push it along. <laughs> well, ladies, thank you. We're going to bring our guest on here in just a moment. Uh, coming up on our program next week. Uh, Dr. William Roper, he's been here before. He runs the UNC Health System. Uh, when we talk about things like the age of repeal and replacement, uh, of which where we find ourselves now debating health care, Dr. William Roper will wade into that. And then in two weeks, former governor of South Carolina is, is, in, is Jim Hodges. Jim Hodges has been on this program before when he was governor, and he will be back now talking about items around education, around health care, around workforce development. Joining us again is someone who has not just organically grown in the Carolinas, but with her many passions and commitments to nonprofit boards and foundations, endowments, corporate boards, her legacy family business, she easily brings to bear pressure and leadership in just the right places to affect real change. We welcome back Minor Shaw. Madam Chair, welcome. Good to have Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, Minor, you've heard a lot of the conversation we have before, but you know, when you kind of, with all of the influence in the boards and, and you know, you roll up your sleeves and you get engaged in initiatives, what do you look at here that you say, you know, the one thing that we can't not just lose sight of during the summer, but what is important to remember? What are those things that we really need to pay attention to? Well, I think right now there's a, a lot of attention being given to economic mobility. Mm -hmm and the lack of economic mobility, particularly in the Carolinas. I think that's something that we all need to pay attention to. And that affects, of course, workforce development. So I think that one of the, one of the main issues that we, we have in the Carolinas, both North and mm -hmm. South Carolina, is workforce development and the lack of a qualified, educated, properly educated workforce to not only deal with the jobs that we have today, but the jobs of the future. And in listening to the conversation previously about the arts and STEAM, I totally agree that STEAM is the way to go and arts are absolutely critical because of the higher thinking mm -hmm. skills. So I think that um, for right now, one of the, the main issues that we have in the Carolinas is the education and workforce development. Let, let, let me go back to economic mobility because you talked about that and that is a, um, if you are in an urban setting like upstate in Greenville or Charlotte or Raleigh or Winston-Salem or Greensboro, there is, not so much in Charleston didn't show up in this, but the, this idea that the, the acceleration and the growth of poverty in those, what we have thought of as progressive New South cities mm -hmm. has been surprising. Did, when you first heard about economic mobility being a challenge and this rise of, of the concentration of poverty, did it surprise you? Well, I knew that we had pockets of poverty, and I've, um, if any time you're involved in the community, and particularly on uh, philanthropic boards and foundations, you know that there's way more poverty than we should have. Mm -hmm. But the lack of economic mobility and the extent of that mobility did surprise me, and particularly I was surprised at the amount of poverty there 
how much the poverty rate has grown in our larger cities in the Carolinas, it's been significant. So it, it's a tremendous issue. But I do think that we are, thankfully, we're looking at it. And we, there are some initiatives that are going on right now, like the Network for Southern Economic N Mobility mm -hmm. that is um, stimulated by MDC, which is based in Durham. Mm -hmm. That network is taking four cities in Georgia, Florida, uh, Tennessee, and South Carolina, Greenville being one of those, looking at what a community can do to come together and build a coalition to help uh, raise people out of poverty, but also what are the various barriers to their success. Mm -hmm. And so they're all looking at um, what, what is working, and each community will work together, and they're all networking together. So I think there are, even though that's only four communities, there are some things going on that we can hopefully replicate across mm -hmm. both states. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Brenda, question? Uh, I have a separate question about your, um, your leadership as a woman. Chris, I commend you. Why are you looking at me when you say that? <laughs> you have three women on your panel oh, this yeah. time, which I think is. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. So I, I commend you, and I think that all too often we don't see uh, women engaged in, in business and philanthropy and in leadership roles altogether, certainly in policy and politics. So I'd love to know more about your journey and, and where you feel like we need to go with women leadership. Well, I feel like I've been very fortunate. I've had wonderful mentors along the way. And that is something that I think for anybody, whether you're a woman or a man, it's very helpful to have mentors. But particularly as I've been growing up and developing um, my leadership skills, that's been critical for me. And I've had opportunities to be on boards where I have been the only woman. Uh, and gradually we're seeing more women on boards. Uh, last year I was on this Women 2020 Women on Boards uh, panel here in Charlotte. And I, I feel like that's really critical. And that's really addressing women, particularly on uh, on for profit boards, but mm -hmm. I think it's important to have women on all boards. And mm -hmm. So it's been a great journey. Um, I think that things are opening up a little bit more. Uh, certainly people are beginning to realize the value, and there's been a lot of research mm -hmm. done about the value of having women on, um, on boards and the thinking, higher thinking skills, uh, mm -hmm. I think, that, that come and the discourse. So it's been a great journey. and. I've been very fortunate to be so, involved. So let me ask you a follow-up on that. Angela, I promise I'm going to sure. give you a chance. I'm trying not to, I don't <laughs> want to dominate. Um, is, it, is, it about the access, is it about the access that women do, do or don't have to a higher leadership level on a corporate board or foundation board or the CEO suite? Or is, and or is it around the talent pool of women who are available to advance to that position? I think there's a talent pool, but I think that it's a very complicated question because there are certainly talented women who are, are able to succeed to the CEO role or to be on boards. But there are also, um, I think, a lot of various things that women have to deal with along the way. Mm -hmm. And so we do have to deal with raising our children. Of course, the husbands are there too, but the women usually are the ones who are taking the, the major responsibility on that. And there's just a lot of different issues that come up along the way as a woman is, is rising along that ladder. And that sometimes it, women can, will get, voluntarily get off that path mm -hmm. to stay at home or to do something else. So I think that it is, um, we're beginning to see, of course, more and more women are in the workforce. I mean, I'd say the majority of women are in the workforce. And now that women are beginning to be on boards, um, and, and more, uh, more regularly, and also you have more women on a board. It takes, it's been proven that three women, you need to really have three mm -hmm. women on a board to have the women's, the female voice um, be as important as it can mm -hmm. be yeah. in setting policy. So it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a question, there are a lot of different reasons for it, yeah. Chris. Okay, Angela? Well, this is a great segue to my question because I wanted to ask you, Minor, you serve on so many cultural and educational boards. Which one is the most fulfilling for you and why? I can't pick just one. <laughs> I didn't think that. you would. Good answer. Good answer. No, I can't do that. What creates that fulfillment for you? But I think you? that what creates the fulfillment for me is the ability to make a difference in people's lives. Mm -hmm. And I particularly have, I, I love the arts. I've been very involved in the arts and helping start the Governor's School for the Arts in Greenville. But I particularly um, 
am attracted towards education and workforce development and then how health and human services go into that, mm -hmm. whether it's early childhood, mm -hmm. and helping make lives better for people. So uh, across the spectrum in the various entities that I'm involved in, foundations, uh, whether it's the with a, a corporation mm -hmm. or whether it is just a, a family foundation, I think all of us are looking at the, um, the our citizens and saying, how can we help their lives um, be better? How can we help people progress? And that's I get excited about that. Brenda? Well, I agree. I think that, that, that you can't choose your, your favorite child, but it's <laughs> nice to see how your, your leadership has grown. Another factor that we deal with a lot is the, the, the rural. You talked about the urban poverty and, and really this mobility gap, but it really is higher in the, in the rural areas. What, what has been your experience with how do we, we transform in the rural areas where they don't have all of these business leaders getting engaged? Well, that's one of the more difficult problems we have in South Carolina, particularly as I drive down, um, you know, you go down I-95 in various mm -hmm. areas of both North and South Carolina, you see an awful lot of poverty along the way and the lack of economic development. But I think that the more we can do in education to help the, our citizens, our young people become educated with the right kind of tools mm -hmm. that they need to be able to um, go into the workforce with the right skills and we need to not just have the zero through 12 but we need to look at obviously post-secondary education mm -hmm. and make sure that our children young people out there now and the young people coming along have the right kind of educational credentials so that they can get a job mm -hmm. that's fulfilling and then the more that we can do that the more educated workforce we'll have and that helps our economic development so we can bring more uh, corporations into the state. And that, that to me is the critical uh, point that we all have to deal with in both North and South Carolina. There was a, um, it wasn't a surprise announcement, but the timing <coughs> of it maybe was, was surprising to people. And that was that Greenville Health System was going to merge with Palmetto Health. Right. Uh, so Midlands and the Upstate created a $4 billion, almost $4 billion organization with about 1.2 million patients or so and this is the, I mean this is a fairly seismic move in healthcare was it a surprise to you is it will it end up being benevolent and good for patients how does that reverberate out over the region well i think it was a surprise definitely but if you look at healthcare and if you look at um, health systems there are a lot of mergers going on all over the nation and certainly for mm -hmm. the small hospitals it's very difficult for them with um, healthcare um, rules and regulations like they are now. But I think that both Palmetto and the Greenville Hospital System, they're both very philanthropic, and I know that they will uh, continue to be that way. This, they will become the largest employer in the state. I think it's 20, 28,000 people. And one of the things that, one of the advantages that will come from this is that I think that half of the state of South Carolina will, with that, uh, with the merger, or the coming together of the two systems, they will be able to access 15 people, excuse me, people yeah. around the state in that particular area will be able to access their health care within 15 minutes, mm -hmm. wherever they are. So if you're looking in the rural areas yeah. in the upstate and all the way to the Midlands, then within 15 minutes, everybody will be able to have access to very high quality health care. So for mm -hmm. South Carolina, I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Angel? So, with your life in service and philanthropy, how are you training the next generation, your own children and your grandchildren? <laughs> well, we do have um, a family foundation, a very small family foundation, but my daughter is on there, my brother is on there, my daughter's on there, and we talk about giving back. We talk about community service and how important it is to, to give back to the community, and I think with all of our children, We've tried to raise our children so that they have um, a desire to give back to the community and help people. And certainly my parents did that with us. Mm -hmm. It was a, a real focus that to whom much is given, you know, much is required, much is expected, and you try to give back and do the best. And we've tried to teach our children that along the way. Is that, you know, we've got less than a minute left, Minor, and you know, you've mentioned workforce development a couple times, and many people around economic development <coughs> circles have said that's one of the biggest issues. Yeah. Um, in 30 seconds, would you expect there, that workforce development would be attended to 
over this n not n legislative year, but do you expect that that's going to stay a priority? I think it's a, a high priority, and it was one of the one of the bills that was in the legislature that was not acted on is still there. So yeah. I think we'll go right into the next legislative session working on workforce development. Okay. Uh, last word, thank mm. you. Thank Good you. Good to have you back on the program. Enjoyed it. Thank and you. thanks for your leadership. I don't I don't thank say you, that Chris. flippantly. You've uh, you've been one of those very stable hands on the tiller, so thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Angela, good to have you on the program. Thank Please you very much. Enjoyed Always it. nice to see you, Brenda Berg. Thanks yeah. for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Until next week, I'm Chris William. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, Bearings, Grant Thornton, Novant Health, Sunoco, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.